one ambulance. Rigged with cameras for the first time ever. To show you what goes on behind closed doors. Body-mounted cameras record everything. Oh, it's going to be another two-hour session of wearing the man bra. Hello, you OK? I'm all turned up. Yeah. <laughs> oh, no, I'm not. No, I'm not. Apparently, it's going to be a fish oil lens on it. It'll make your face look even fatter than it is. Hey! <laughs> Where's the button, Jamie? It's there. We'll reveal what it's really like... So where are you hurting? ..to be a paramedic. Hello there, Lawrence. Do you know what? <laughs> High five, yeah, well done, love. We're with the West Midlands Ambulance Service. We get life, we get death. We have a bit of everything. As they deal with 3,000 emergency calls each day. We're not in the Bronx. Yes! And it's red one, let's go. Blue light. Taking you right to the heart of the action. You come for that? Not really. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That's the worst bit over. All right. We went to um, a residential home the other day and they bought us out. It was like, it was almost like afternoon tea at the Ritz. They bought us out little pieces of different cakes, Victoria sponge, carrot cake, bread and butter puddings. I've had some good cakes and I've been to, to care around. I got so, so annoyed at myself the other night. I haven't, every time I've been shopping, I've refused to buy chocolate, any chocolate, sweets, anything. And I had a proper craving the other night, and it was like, like 11 o'clock and I was like, you stupid woman, why did you get a slice of chocolate? <laughs> Hey. How random. Gherkins and crackers. Mm. Crackers from your chili can Crackers from your chili. Mm. Can't have nachos, I'm being healthy. <laughs> when I'm driving home after a night shift, mm. um, I think to myself, I really want a McDonald's, but I really want a coffee, but if I have a coffee, then I won't go to sleep. Yeah. So then I don't end up getting it. I think the only time that I've ever slept after it was um, after I gave birth to Noah. Because <laughs> I'd literally been awake for 36 that was hours. so not what I was expecting <laughs> you to say. <laughs> but I was so tired. <laughs> I drank loads of Lucas and Red Bull. <laughs> and then I just literally went... Because <laughs> 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 I, I was trying to stay awake to feed the baby. <laughs> well, well, that's a good thing to have before you breastfeed, isn't it? Red Bull, they are some. <laughs> Welcome so to the world. <laughs> <laughs> Monday evening, 9 p.m. I keep banging my head on that. Going to an unconscious 70. One year old. Oh, oh, had a Jamie Cashmore and Debbie Woodcock are eight hours into their 12 hour shift. Oh, gosh, you're so sweet. Nine, nine, nine. Yeah. Oh. I'll be unconscious in a minute from tiredness. <laughs> it's a strange day, isn't it? I know. I'll tell you, it feels like a Sunday. I just don't know what day it feels like, end of. Feels like Sunday. The patient Jamie and Debbie have been called to has type 2 diabetes. Sugars, 2.1. Aha! Caller has moved away from the line to try and give patient Lucozade. Patient's face has drooped. Caller not sure if patient has had a stroke, although his blood sugars are only 2 points of it. Blood sugar, it does exactly what it says on the tin. Um, it measures the amount of sugar in your blood. Without sugar, the body doesn't function properly. All cells need it. Normal range in a healthy patient would be between four and eight. So 2.1 is quite bad. Please. All right, sweetheart. All right. <laughs> OK. They arrive to find the patient unconscious. His partner is panicking. 
What's the gentleman's name? Anthony Wright. Anthony. And what's the problem with Anthony? What's happened? The sugar two point one. Okay. And you've just checked that, have you? Yes, yes. Is he diabetic then, sweet? Yeah, Do you want to come over here so I can? Very, very bad. He's got it. So you, sh we'll check it again, eh? Just to make sure. He's absolutely sad. All right, Chuck, don't panic. Has he had one before? Yes. And what relation are you to I'm him? His All right. Sweet. Tony's low blood sugar level means he is hypoglycemic, a diabetic emergency. Without rapid treatment, it can result in organ damage and ultimately death. Among other symptoms, Tony is having muscle tremors. All right. Don't have a panic. It's all right. Sweet. When did he last have the hypo? Sweetie, oh, he's got a finger. Can you grab him? Yeah, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Come on, darling. Come on. Let go of your fingers, let go. Let go. Ow! <laughs> Just leave him. Let, let, don't it. touch him, sweetheart, cos he'll grab you again. All right, we'll 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 do what we can. Don't worry, all right? Yeah, where's my thing? Even though his eyes are open, Tony is drifting in and out of consciousness. The hypo is making him confused and belligerent. He could start convulsing or fall into a coma. Jamie and Debbie need to retest his blood sugar immediately. It's so strong. They are sweetheart when they're like this, I'm afraid. They need a blood sample from the side of one of his fingers. But because his hands are closed so tightly, it's impossible. Yeah, let me do it from here so I can get it. Down here, come on. Oh. Hang on. And open your eyes. Come on. Definitely, you won't. Give me that. I've got it now, hang on. I've got it now, I've got it. Hold on. No, you'll have to do another one, Jack. Okay, just pass me. Pass me here. Although he's unconscious, Tony fights them constantly. Just hold his arm. I've got his arm. Just hold his Right, try that. In the end, it takes all three of them to manage it. Yeah, got it. Hey, come on. Wake up. Come on. 1.3. Okay. okay. Tony's levels are continuing to drop. He's now severely hypoglycemic. Do you want to get glucose on? Yeah. I'm not even going to get close. No, no, the... that's fine. I'll do it for me. The cannula. Sorry, we needed to get Tony's blood sugar up as quickly as we could because we didn't want him to stay the way he was for too much longer. One of the routes that I can do as a paramedic is to obviously put a needle into a vein and then give him some glucose straight through. But that was going to be too dangerous. It was going to be dangerous for the patient me and Debbie as well. Um, so we opted to go with an injection in the arm. Tony, stay there for you got me. It. Um, it's all right, Tony. Right, sweetheart, he's had the injection, all right, yeah. at the minute. Yeah. So we'll just yeah. wait a bit, OK? Yeah. Don't panic. I'm not... Uh... I know it's hard. Tony's last hypo was three months ago. Pat called the ambulance then. This time, it's much worse. Look, he thought he was having a stroke. Leave him, darling, in a minute. Don't worry, I'll stop him. We'll stop him. Just... All right. This is the worst I've ever seen him. This is what happens when people have a hypo. They can really abnormal behaviour. Now he's got memory. <coughs> Do you suffer That's with well. dementia at yeah. all? Right, OK. Which is the one dead. So he's oh. got diabetes, he's got dementia. Where else has he got? Going blind, going deaf. Is he? Come on, wake up for me. It'll take about 15 minutes for that to start kicking in. All right, because has he eaten today? He ate it all. He eats rubbish, that's what he does. Has he had breakfast? Oh, he's had towels and everything. And he's had dinner? He has had some treats. He has beans and towels. Was that for lunch, then? Yeah, yeah. He does now eat me, don't he? Yeah. He's, he's... It's now 15 minutes since the injection, and Tony's still not showing proper signs of recovery. <laughs> Tony was taking a lot longer than we would have liked. That normally means at that point that the injection that we've given has been ineffective. Worst case scenario, for being completely honest, would be that his blood sugar would drop that low that he'd go into cardiac arrest. Debbie and Jamie check his blood sugar again. They know it's not going to be a normal level, above four, but they need it to be higher than the 1.3 it was when they arrived. 2.4. We're, we're coming. We're, we're getting going, there. We're going in the right direction. 
His blood sugar is slowly coming up, so we'll just give it a few more minutes. Pat and Tony have been together for 17 years. In the last three years, she's become his full-time carer. Do you have any help? Nobody. Nobody, not like social services or anything. Do it all on my own. Um, we can put in a referral yeah, for you to, yeah. to get some to start getting some help. I, I do, I do, I do need help. Yeah. It's now 21 minutes since Tony had the hormone injection. Yeah. At that point, you start thinking, what else is going on? I was thinking, I'm going to have to pop a needle into him somewhere, and I didn't really didn't want to because of how combative he was. Tony, Tony. Jamie and Debbie have been called to a diabetic man having a severe hypoglycemic attack. He's normal and he's not like this. Tony's now been unconscious for over 40 minutes. A hormone injection should have brought him round, but so far, it's had no effect. Tony? Tony? It's almost like he's... Hello? doesn't want to speak to does he? Oh. Hello? <laughs> there we go. You all right? Lovely. That was good. You've had a hypo. Your blood sugar's dropped. Has he? Yeah, so we're just checking you over. We were so relieved. Oh, yeah, I was... I was Definitely. Like, Thank God for that. All of a sudden, it was like, someone switched the lights on. <laughs> What's this? For your blood, cos your sugar's gone very bad again. Really? Yeah. Yeah, we couldn't pick you up. You're too fat. Gotta put you on a diet. Hey! <laughs> They're now able to make Tony more comfortable in bed, and it's safe for him to eat and drink. Can we get you drinking some Lucas Aid? Thirsty. You want Mars? Do I give him Mars? Will he eat toast? Yeah, will he eat something solid more like yeah. toast and jam or something? Well, yeah, toast with jam on it. <laughs> That's dirty. This is our baby. If there's oh. one thing that gets you better, it's that. <laughs> the toast and energy drink are working. Okay. They check his blood sugar level every 20 minutes and won't leave until it's stabilised above seven. I'll pass it through one more. An hour and 19 minutes after they arrived, he's finally OK. No problem. 7.6 so, blood sugar. Brilliant. Happy so yeah. what I've done, I've done the referral for Thank you for social you. services. I'm so grateful for that. Right. So, I think that's everything. Yeah. But if he has another one, just phone him and say, sorry. Ab yeah, absolutely. And not to have a panic attack. <laughs> <laughs> Don't worry. It's a, sc it's a scary thing to see. It is Every scary. single Should diabetic is different. Anything? If they have a hypo, it's so different, everyone. They can love you, they can hate you, they can try and kick you out of the house. They can do anything and everything. You've just got to expect the unexpected, I think. Right. It's ready? two hours since Jamie and Debbie first got the call. With Tony out of danger, they can leave. I really didn't think he was going to come round. It took a long time, didn't it? It did. God, he nearly broke her fingers. No, he did. He grabbed them and bent them back. Oh, did you see the dogs? How cute they were. Oh, no. They were, they were, they were like... guarding him. I oh, know. They were actually guarding him and that toast he was eating. Finger and it's ready to do my head down. Are you happy? Nope. <laughs> ready, Daniel? Yes. Let's do this. Try and crash it before we get out of here. Yeah, um... please. Loz Horobin and Dan Smith are heading out on a 12 hour night shift. I know. I'm we're going to have all outside jobs tonight. As long as you have different jobs, I don't mind. It's yeah. really exciting. It's really different. I do. It's some excitement in my life. 
Let's get it off so boring done. <laughs> Their first call comes in. A man's been assaulted on a bus. Whisky Lima 4362, thank you. Appreciate the trouble nine call still in progress for this job. And um, we're not too far away. It's just come up as a assault domestic. Just wondered if police had been contacted or if the attacker had left scene. Uh, I'm gonna look for you. Um assault on the bus, offenders have left scene. Uh, we've got no information as to whether police are on scene or en route. Um, so just to double check, this is on a public transport bus, correct? Yeah, that's fair to do. 6-2, thank you. So at least if we're going to go to somebody that's been assaulted on a bus, there'll be other people yeah. there rather than just going to the oh, middle nice. of nowhere. Yeah. Or a house where we've got nowhere to escape. Yeah. We get quite a lot of jobs where it's domestic or assault in progress and you don't know if the attacker's there or not, ambulance crews regularly do get attacked. So it's really, really important to try and protect our safety. We wouldn't want to put ourselves in a dangerous situation. I know where it is. It's on the corner, isn't it? Yeah. Right, just before Lidl. Ah, oh, the place there, which is good. <laughs> Hello, you're right. Hello. Male, 50, been yep. assaulted by two people, punch, punch, punch. Yeah. That's exactly about. He's saying he's had four points. Okay. Other people saying he's had more. Okay. What's his name? Mark. Hi, Mark. You're okay. What time did all this happen? Well, about in an hour ago. It's about quarter past seven now. About an hour ago. Okay, just relax for me. Mark is bleeding from the head and still shaking from the shock of the attack. Were you with Mark? Were you? Uh, or? I'm his son, I Oh, right, OK. No He's trouble. After. Yeah, Probably OK. Years. So you were on the bus at the time, were you? No, no, I was in there. Right. And I came out, tried to get on the bus. Yeah. And two people who I was with just wailed me. Right, so you know them, do you? Yeah, yeah. Oh, right. Yeah. That's not very nice of them, is it? No. Yeah. We'll get you on the back of the ambulance, clean you up, check you over, and we'll make a decision what we're doing. Is that all right? <laughs> 50-year-old Mark runs his own gardening business, but today he'd taken a break to go and watch the football with some friends. 6 2 Four, three, six, two. Yeah, just letting you know, we have found the patient um, and we're just currently treating him. So what we'll do is um, we'll just clean it up and then we can see, you know, if you've got any war wounds. Call you just above your... Below your eyebrow there, hasn't he? Mark piercing. Lovely. Mark's also bleeding from a cut on his head. Let's get you cleaned yeah. up. We've been down the walls. Right. Last game of the season. Well, someone's got to go, haven't they, Mark? <laughs> I don't normally drink that much. I'm yeah. not going to comment cos I'm a Villa fan. I yeah, don't... I don't... I'm not really a football fan. So you've had a couple of points down there, come down here and then... Well, come, come out with the lads, cos it's last game of the season. You know, lads having a laugh and yeah. a drink and everything. But Mark says things then turned nasty. The other guys got really aggressive with me, so I'll just, I'll just chuck me for points everywhere and that was it. Well, that was a white sweat. Yeah, I'll just say, I'm Gary. I'll get the bus back to Wolverhampton, come out here onto the bus, and both of them just wild, wild into them. Alcohol can often mask symptoms, so Loz needs to find out if there's more to this assault than a bloody face. You've got a, a fair bit of bruising this side of your head, Mark. Yeah, it was just where there was wailing, man. Were you knocked to the floor? Did they punch you, or...? Uh, yeah, well, obviously. Yeah. I didn't know if they'd used a weapon, like a bat or anything. No. No? Mm -hmm. OK. With a head injury, um, one of the things you think of is concussion. So we obviously haven't witnessed the attack on Mark, so we need to determine what his injuries are and if he's got any signs and symptoms. OK. So at the moment, you've got no blurred vision? No. You don't feel sick? No. You don't feel dizzy? No. So the, the injuries that you've got, you've got a little cut above your left eye. OK. Right, it's got a bit of a, a lip there, haven't you? Mm. No, it'll be all right. <laughs> no, I've never had stitching in my life, so... I think right. it just might need a little bit of glue, if I'm honest. Yeah. Close not, your eye again for me, mate. It's not... She's not blazing. It's not hanging off. <laughs> Can you take 
take him to hospital? Um, possibly, possibly not. Obviously, I'd like him to be with someone if he's had a head injury for the next 24 hours. So if he can have Sun stay with him tonight, maybe, and then he can go home. He's got a cut to his eye. We're just cleaning it up and making a decision if it needs stitches or not at the moment. Dan's doing some final checks for any sign of brain injury. Just have a look at my huge nose. Tells everyone that, Mark. <laughs> Nobody ever says it's not either. Mark's pupils are equal and reactive, which is a good sign. How's his eye looking now? Let's have a look. Just lift your head up for me. I'm just going to... Yeah, that's going to need a bit of glue. All right, cos you're going to end up with a mouth on your eyelid otherwise. Are you Aiden? Yeah, do you want to jump on for a sec? Laws needs Mark's son to look after his dad and look out for any of the warning signs of concussion. For the next 24 hours, he'll need to be the parent. He's got a little cut above his eye, which you can see. If he's sick, if he's drowsy, if he loses consciousness, has any severe headaches, blurred vision, call treble one or treble nine, depending on the severity. Obviously, if it's headaches, blurred vision, treble one. If he's unconscious, treble nine. But I'll write the advice down, and it's just basically keeping an eye on him for 24 hours. So, all right. All right. All the best, Mark. OK. The cut above Mark's eye can be glued at A&E, but he doesn't need an ambulance to take him there, leaving Loz and Dan free to help someone else. Ruined Mark's night, didn't it? Yeah. At least, though, even though he was technically intoxicated, he wasn't he hammered. Wasn't, he as... wasn't particularly drunk, was No. He? Most people go to are really abusive, aren't they, when they're drunk? It is only eight o'clock, though, isn't it? Another life saved. Aye, right, yes. We're doing well. <laughs> I thought you wanted to be Batman. Well, I don't think I'm cool enough to be Batman. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> You've got a Batman key ring. <laughs> the Batman key ring. The, heart, the dream is there. Batman. The dream is there. <laughs> I thought I was your sidekick. You I was are, Robin. You are my Robin, yeah. <laughs> yeah, afternoon, mate. Just booking on with yourselves. You've got uh, Cashmore and Woodcock on this vehicle. Um, 1300 till 0100 received. It's Tuesday lunchtime. Oh, there you are. I was looking for you. <laughs> yeah, I know. We've just been passing each other, literally. I've booked us on and they've not touched us yet. And it's not long before Jamie and Debbie get their first call of the shift. So we are going to 18-year-old Chelsea. She's collapsed. Um, notes on the case are passed out. She's under investigation for heart problems. Normally faints, but was passed out for five minutes. Mm. Wonder the heart problems is. We know she said a lot. There's a lot of people getting younger with heart problems, though. Now. Yeah, but that this, is, this national, there's been national campaigns and everything about it. Hasn't there about like sudden cardiac death? I know. Look how many staff have heart problems. Well, that's true. Our yeah. staff that are coming down with heart problems. Well, we don't do ourselves any favours doing caffeine nights. Fourteen minutes after leaving base, they arrive at the college where the teenager has passed out. It's not the first time that Chelsea has had an episode here. Hello. Right, which one's the patient? Hello there. The one that looks really well. Right, okay. Um, well, I pass out for like three, five minutes. My around my Okay. Has that ever happened before like that? Not the blue. Okay, okay. When we arrived, initially, Chelsea looked really well, but obviously there was more to it when we started to get the story from her. Chelsea told me she'd had a loop recorder fitted, uh, which is basically a device that's put in during an operation, and it basically, it's like a mini recorder of what happens in the heart, so what rhythm the heart's in. Automatically, it makes you think, 
they're investigating some form of heart issue, but they don't know what yet. If these episodes happen, do you just normally scan over it, or what happens? Every time it's different, like... Every time it's different. Sometimes I know it's going to happen, because it's like when Dizzy's sweating, you know, like, like nightmares and stuff. OK. Um, and then sometimes I can literally just be in the middle of conversation and drop and have a note on me when I do it. Did you know it was going to happen today? No. no. OK. So what were you doing when it actually happened? Standing there talking to the air. And literally straight down. Ninety six, seventy six. Okay, okay. Is there any heart problems in the family? Dad's got a heart murmur. Yeah. Um, my brother's got an open heart surgery when she was born. Are you Staff phoned Chelsea's mum when she passed out, and she came straight to the school. You know. It's so sleepy, but every time I wake up, my lips like light now. My lips feel swollen, but they're not. They just feel quite big, and I get things and needles in my hands and feet, and my lips are tingly as well sometimes. And like twice, I've wet myself lately as well, which hasn't happened before. When I've been out, I've woke up and wet. Okay. As soon as I heard that she'd wet herself, it kind of triggered alarm bells in my own head that this isn't just a simple faint. There's something else going on. Okay. Have they ever done an EEG? No. Have they ever tested for epilepsy? I would be quite contacted on my heart. They just keep ruining really, really it because she had know. these... At the start. Radiant, the yeah, start, but yeah. I think that sounds a bit yeah. like a drop attack, especially if... Yeah. Sometimes I like when I know what's happened, and sometimes I like what's happened where I'm on, I sort of panic a bit and I... It sounded like a drop attack, which is a, a form of epilepsy, and it's where all the electrical signals in the brain go completely haywire. You lose all muscle tone, all control, and you drop to the floor and you're unconscious. There's no actual what people would perceive as fitting. There's no shaking. Inside the ambulance, Jamie continues to try to work out what's going on. And you've not felt unwell in any way apart from... Obviously, these passionate um, episodes. I've had and a headache. You've had a headache. Yeah. How long have you had the headache for? Like, about an hour. About and like, I was literally, when I was standing up, saying, I said to Leanne, I've got a headache. Yeah. I've got a really bad headache, and then literally, seconds after I passed out. Okay. Do you ever, have you ever had headaches when you've had it before? Um, I sort of suffer with migraines anyway. Okay. They're not as bad as they used to be. Um, I've calmed down a lot, but I do still get migraines sometimes. You know, when they've been investigating this, did you tell them about the migraines that you've had? Did they know? Um, I'm not sure. I don't see Because if you if you if you got a history of migraines, and all of a sudden you start passing out and everything. So I've never really asked. Like literally, I've never ever concentrated. They've, they've like, just got it your heart, and that's yeah, it. Yeah, like, literally. But what makes Chelsea's condition more concerning is that she's got an 18-month-old daughter. Yeah. And she started passing out when she's with her. What's your little one's name? Scarlet. Scarlet. Yeah. Oh, that's lovely, that is. This is the one thing that worries me. Like, I pass out and I was holding her. And as I was falling, my best friend, that was the girl, that was with my mum. Yeah. Had to literally grab her as I was just letting her fall. Oh, God. I, she wasn't her. I think. She was just more, like, scared, because obviously she felt. Yeah, and, yeah. and you've been out of it as well. She and she's seen me pass out a lot. When I wake up, she says, saying, Mommy, Mommy, she's crying, it's horrible. Oh. It's horrible. And that's a stress fact, doesn't it? That yeah. adds to the stress of it, doesn't mm -hmm. it, as well? I always think I'd never forgive myself if I ever pass out. I hold her, I'd really hurt her. I'd never forgive myself. That's one thing that really scares me. Yeah, I'll take all these off. Mm -hmm. We'll pop you in on the stretcher. All right. Okay. On arrival at New Cross Hospital in Wolverhampton, Jamie will relay his concerns to the A&E staff. The toast was burning in the toaster, so she'd rung the fire brigade. So they got there, we got there, so it was under the toast that was on fire, there's no actual active fire, blah, blah, blah. We popped the toaster, we opened the windows, like, everything's fine. And this woman was worried that they'd, like, squirted water all over her kitchen and all this sort of stuff. And we were trying to, like, get across to her the fact that they didn't, there wasn't actually there a was fire, no fire, so it was OK. Yeah. 
It was just your toast that was smoking. Yeah, it was just, just a couple of slices of mighty white, everything else is fine. Yeah. So they were in the back of our truck and we were assessing them. So we sat there and I was sat at like, the back of the truck looking through the bulkhead, heard lights and sirens, and I was like, oh, what's going on here? Two fire trucks came back again. I was like, what? So the husband had phoned the fire brigade from work, saying my wife's in the house and the house is on fire. And they came back and went, is there anything going on? I was like, nope, there's, there's, still, there's still no fire. So they dispatched the fire twice and us, all for two slices of burnt toast. I take it she didn't make you any toast when you got there? No, she didn't. No toast, no tea. No tea, no toast. No, Monday evening, quarter to eight. Three hours to go till the end of Hannah Meredith and Carly Manning's shift. You've been sent to a job. What we need you to do is go get the bariatric stretcher and then we have a crew in attendance in Litchfield who require the bariatric stretcher. The bariatric stretcher is used for obese patients, too big or too heavy to fit on a regular one. But this isn't just a delivery job. The patient in Litchfield is a 38-year-old man with serious chest pains. The blue lights are on. It's quite useful to have the bariatric stretchers, though, isn't it? Because I think nowadays, more lifestyle in general, there's more obesity, isn't there? Yeah, definitely. We're starting to use it more and more. This is, this is the weight, but then a lot of the time, if the patient is too wide well, yeah. and you can't get the sides up, then you've still got to use the bariatric stretcher. It's not comfortable. And the belts don't fit either. That's the other thing. The bariatric stretcher is significantly wider than a regular stretcher. It can carry someone weighing up to 63 stone. Hi. Hello. Hello. Chris is already being looked after by another crew. They've given him gas and air to help his chest pain. He needs to go to hospital, but the stretcher won't fit in the house so they have to find a way to move him. Chris, um, does the pain start in your chest then go down into your tummy or has yeah, it started? Yeah, it starts about here and then it goes down and then it spreads across the top of my stomach. Although normally with chest pains, we don't get patients to walk at all because obviously the more exertion they do, um, the more strain it puts on the heart and we don't want that if it's already under stress anyway. Um, but in this case, we had no choice but to get the stretcher as close as we possibly could and, and get Chris to walk out to the stretcher. Chris had major weight loss surgery 14 years ago, a gastric bypass operation where his digestive system was rerouted past most of his stomach. So it takes much less food for him to feel full. Past, so. Got me to hold on to that, yeah. That was one of the first bariatric uh, patients to be done from outside the Birmingham area. Mm. I was the first male to be done, and I was the first person of my size to be done, because when I, at one point, I was over 60 stone. Is that comfortable? Yep, yeah, that's Is that all right, right yeah? Yep. Yeah. The ambulance has a winch system to pull the bariatric stretcher on board. Um, do you know how much you weigh now, Chris? Uh, 212 at last oh, weight. Oh, talk to me in stone. I'm old, I uh, am. That will be 34 stone. Was it? Lost no, it's 32. You've lost so you've lost nearly half your body weight yeah. then, haven't you? Yeah. Lost That's pretty lost impressive. Time. They start the 15-mile journey to hospital in Burton-upon-Trent. Chris's mum, who lives just up the road, is coming too. Do you have any carers or anything, Chris? Yeah, she's sitting next to you. <laughs> <laughs> Don't have anyone else coming? No, no. Are you a bit more mobile now? You've lost quite a lot of weight. Yeah, because before I was completely bedridden. Yeah, um, now at least I'm able to walk a bit. Um, not as much as I would like to, but we'll get there. Oh, that's good that you're motivated, though. You're motivated yeah, to I mean, carry on. That was the worst time of my life, that was being completely bedridden. It was the most horrific 
and the most embarrassing and horrible time. And I wasn't even, even able to get up to use the toilet. When he was at school, Chris was bullied because of his weight. He spent two years in his bedroom as a result. That, in turn, led to mental health problems that lasted for many years. You used to fear coming home, didn't you? Because of my mental health. I was that bad. I mean, I know I, I, know I was that bad. I mean, I, I was suicidal. It was, it was just awful. The journey to hospital takes 25 minutes. The gas and air has helped to keep Chris's pain low. The staff in A&E will now run a series of tests to work out what's wrong. Once they've handed Chris over to the hospital staff, Carly and Hannah start the long journey back from Burton-upon-Trent. The other crew were saying that the last time that that gentleman had to go to hospital prior to losing all his weight, he had to be um, lifted out of a first floor window with the fire service, and that must have been pretty awful. Wow. Imagine if he was on the floor. How many people would it take to lift him up off the floor? Bless him, he's such a nice guy as well. to a house up there once, round the corner. Mm. Talking about dogs earlier. I walked in through the front door and it bit me on the stomach. Dogs just don't seem to like you at all, do they? Maybe you're just not dog approachable. I think it just it makes me a bit wary of dogs now and they sort of pick up on that, don't they? Yeah. That one earlier was absolutely fine with me, wasn't it? Yeah. Took one look at you and was like... <laughs> The West Midlands Ambulance Service deals with around 3,999 calls every day. Many of those calls come from people who are chronically ill and struggling to cope. It's Tuesday afternoon, and Neil Weaver and Steve Geno are responding to a 999 call from an 81-year-old woman with breathing difficulties. I've got a feeling I've been here before. If it's the one I'm thinking of, it should be just here on the left. Yeah. Hello, you all right? Thank you very much. <laughs> Hello there. Hello. So what's been the problem, Lil? <laughs> You're breathing. How long's your breathing been feeling bad? <laughs> Last night, I had two attacks. Do you have breathing problems anyway? No. You don't, so this is a new thing for you. Yeah. Are these your inhalers here, Lil? Yeah. So you have asthma? Yeah. Okay, got nothing more than the asthma. It's clear Lillian has a number of health issues. She's diabetic as well as asthmatic and has problems with her blood pressure. And she tells okay. Steve she hasn't even been downstairs for nine years. Do you have any pain at the moment? If I if I if I breathe, feel as if somebody is ripping me apart. So if you take a deep breath, how does that feel? Painful. First of all, you look at the patient, have a look at their colour, have a look at the way that they're breathing, are they using any sort of accessory muscles to breathe and things like that. Then we can listen to the patient's chest, listen for any sort of abnormal sounds there, any wheezes, any sort of crackles or anything like that. No, I'm just going to quickly have a listen to your chest and then we'll have a little look at everything else that's going on with you just to make sure there's nothing going on with your asthma. Can you breathe normally for me? Putting all of those together, then you're able to sort of establish hopefully what's going on with the patient and what's causing the, the difficulty in breathing. Your chest sounds pretty good at the moment. <clears throat> so that's 95? 95. 95, that's good. It was quite evident that some of that pain that she was experiencing was partly as a result of the fact that she'd been breathing rather rapidly for some time. Having listened to her chest, it was quite obvious that there were no problems with her lungs. What we'll do, Lil, if it's OK with you, we'll just do the heart tracing, and then we'll take them straight yeah, up. Yeah, we won't right? leave them on for long. The ECG showed that there didn't appear to be any problems with her heart. 
Steve starts to suspect that Lillian's shortness of breath is caused by anxiety rather than anything physical. I'm fainted in December and I bashed my head on the stair and got butt the bottom of the stair. Is that why you've called us more because you're scared of, of what might happen rather than what is happening at the moment? I don't know. You don't, if you don't know, I don't know. <laughs> it seems a serious fall might be the root of Lillian's anxiety. Her son Paul was the one who found her. I think that one out there seems to have knocked her confidence quite a lot as well from what she was saying. Well, she was completely passed down and then she was like stone full. I actually thought she'd die because she, uh, she was staring and she couldn't move her eyes. Yeah. No flick of her tongue was out, teeth came out. I thought, oh my gosh, she's gone. Sometimes it, it's just necessary to spend a little bit of time with people uh, and just reassuring them and talking to them you will find that they start to calm down and they start to recover really well. Good news, Lil. Your blood pressure's maintaining there. <laughs> That's all OK. Sometimes, Lil, sometimes these pains, they, they last for a long time. No disrespect, when you get a little bit older, it, it takes your body a lot longer to heal than it did when you were younger as well. You forget that you're getting older. I forget that I'm getting older. I get aches and pains that I never used to get. That's it, we can't and do quite the same as we used no, to. No, no. And when you're into your 70s and 80s, that can only be worse for you, can't mm. it? It must be quite difficult. You're certainly looking a bit better now than you did do. Yes, yeah, you've got a little and bit of colour now, that, you? that pain as well doesn't seem to be as bad. <laughs> Are you happy? You seem a lot better now. <laughs> I get upset a lot. I, I, I tend to get... I tend to cry a lot. With Lil, she was quite happy not to attend hospital, and at that point, there was no need for her to go to hospital. Lil, lovely to meet you. Thank you. Fingers crossed everything works out with the doctor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If you have any problems, you can always call us back. Okay. All right? Who's best for Stephen? Stephen Neil. Stephen Neil. Or, if you're not happy with us, you can ask for anyone else, can't yeah. you? <laughs> <laughs> Take care, Lil. All the best, Lil. In all, Steve and Neil have spent an hour and 40 minutes with Lillian. You're all right. Right. Okay, thank you. All the best, all right. Like I said, if she has any problems or anything, you can always call us back before yeah. the doc gets here, all right? Take care. There's a lot of people out there who don't have that support, don't have that network around them. There are a, a few regular callers that we get who, who call mostly because they have no other... Um, no other outside contact, no, really, isn't it? No. We, we, we can sometimes be the only people that they see. Chelsea collapsed again a few days later. She's been referred to a neurologist and, as Jamie suspected, is having tests for epilepsy. Her blackouts have become so frequent, she's had to stop going to college, but is managing to study for her BTEC from home. She really wants to be a nursery nurse. Lillian called 999 again 48 hours later. She was then kept in hospital for 10 days, where a hernia was discovered. They're not operating due to her age, so she's now home with morphine patches for the pain. The hospital gave Chris an ECG, but nothing came up. His GP has now referred him for an MRI scan on his gallbladder to see if gallstones caused his pain. Sweet. Another life saved. <laughs>